All right. All right, all right, all right. Good evening, everybody. My name is Shirley Williams. I am a New York City-based producer and director, and I'm so happy to be here tonight. We have an incredible panel, incredible humans. Um, this is uh, a, a third part to a series that the One Guild Women's Impact Network, also known as WIN, has been putting on. Um, it's a discussion series on equity in our industry, a six part series where we aim to discuss how we can move toward equity in our industry from writing and development to casting to crewing up, financing, marketing and distribution and with institutional changes. Our previous panels were writing with equity in mind and inclusive casting. Uh, we will post those previous links for you to review if you didn't get a chance to check them out. This is our third session, Crewing Up. And in this session, we'll examine being intentional about hiring with diversity in mind, how to find a diverse crew, and how to impact hiring practices to be more equitable and groom new talent. We'll have some actionable takeaways that will pro be provided following the session. So please stay tuned for that. We have incredible speakers who have made a very significant impact as leaders in, in, in to, institutionalizing hiring practices for recruiting, training and building a diverse team um, some are friends of mine, some I'm fans of, some I look up to and I admire all powerhouses. Uh, we have Nina Yang Bon Jovi, co-founder of Significant Productions and creative partner at AUM Group. We have Bree Frank, who is the VP of production for Hello Sunshine and founder of Hue You Know. And then Tammy Garns, Director of Education and Understanding at Array. Uh, these are our phenomenal and dynamic panelists. Thank you so much for your time, for your contribution, for your support, not just to uh, for this panel and for the producers listening and tuned in, but for our community and our world at large. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll dig right in. I'll dig right, right in. I think um, as a means to ground ourselves, it's really important, right, when we're talking about these things that we're clear on definitions and what things mean. Um, Ver Verne Myers has a quote that says, diversity is being invited to the party. Inclusion is being asked to dance. And then there was, uh, there, was, there was some build upon that that says equity is ensuring everyone has appropriate transportation to the dance. So I would love to hear from you, you all, what is your definition of equity? I'll certainly, I can start. I think that um, for me, equity is exactly that, like understanding and realizing the systems that um, have been put in place to leave underrepresented people, having the ability to understand that there was even a bus to get to the dance, right? <laughs> Recognizing that that exists and to really focus on making it equitable and often that means like being uncomfortable. One of the things, one of my favorite quotes from Oprah is, um, there is no growth in shame. And I think that shame is the road to diversity, but it is not the road to inclusion, equity, and belonging. And for me, what I'm seeing is like the reaction to cancel culture and people trying to run from it. And as a default, they're running to diversity where my entire focus is centered around inclusion, equity, and belonging. Okay, I'll, I'll jump in. Do you wanna jump in, Nina? No, go ahead, Tammy. <laughs> I'll jump in. So, you know, equity, it's interesting. I've come from a space where I started in entertainment and went to education and came back to entertainment recently. 
And so the way that the world defines equity depends on what space you're living into, right? So if you're talking about equity in this particular industry, in the entertainment industry, we're talking about a whole different kind of system than if you're talking about whether or not people have fair housing, whether or not people are able to be educated properly in their schools. So equity to me means that you know enough about yourself, you know enough about your um, abilities, you've been groomed and educated enough in a proper way that you actually know what is out there for you in the world, right? So, so again, like Bree said, if you don't even know there's a bus, so how do you get that knowledge? Who gives that to you? And the person who gives that to you or the people that give that to you throughout your, your lifetime really matter because they could actually be setting you up for an inequitable life. So equity um, is all about all of the systems, people and places that come together to breathe into you who you are um, and then how you're able to, to work in the world around you um, as far as I'm concerned. And then when it layers into the film industry and the television industry, do you even know, do you even feel worthy enough to be a part of this business if you're not someone who grew up around it? Do you even know there's a place for you here? So the day that we become equitable in our industry is the day that the little kid in uh, the small town knows that this is, a, this is a career choice for them and that it's not some far off dream. I love that. Um, just piggybacking on, on what Tammy and Brie both talked about, when I talk about equity and inclusion, um, very specifically, I look at budget equity, financing equity, acquisition equity, because that's something I run into whenever I want to put a project together. And when it's of um, BIPOC narrative, I'm always told less budget. It's just the way it is. And, and then when I make a film and I wanna sell it, the acquisition numbers that come in are much lower hmm. as opposed to my counterparts in the same space. So what I see is I, I would like to see equity in that budget equity when it comes to projects, film projects, television projects, and then acquisition equity when it's to value worth of the stories that we wanna produce and tell. Yeah, you, you, you all just, you sparked some thinking for me, like, you know, in terms of, I'm hearing you say that people have to have information, right? So that, so that's, that's one piece. One, how do we reach folks to get them the information so that they can be a part of, so that they can have access? And then two, right, how do we get the people, Nina, the, the people who are the financiers who can who can distribute the funds and who can create equitable financing and in, in a space how do we get them to even to shift their paradigm their mindset so that they're aligned and they and they want to be a part of the work and they want to support bipoc uh, uh, voices in that way this is um it's yeah. interesting for me. Sorry, Sammy, do you go ahead? No, go, go. It's interesting. Um, this is a very interesting thing for me because I think that as people try to like venture into the space when they're doing DEI work, I feel like there's like this um, this narrative of it being treated as like a pet project or an aside. And I always say that like, we're not doing the make a wish uh, version of allowing black indigenous people of color into spaces, right? Like we have to be able to recognize the humanity and BIPOC professionals, which I always add professionals to it so that people can stop thinking that there's this charity work, right? Like bringing a diverse background is the thing that helps your bottom line and it's also the right thing to do. And I think that when people are trying to do good work, then they put themselves in the position of like being a hero. And I say like, don't be a hero, be a human, right? Like you need to recognize that humans deserve to be in the space as storytellers. If we want to be true lovers of story, then we have to be honor the truth. And you're not telling the truth if you are not including black indigenous people of color to the table. And that's, yeah. No, I'm a hundred percent with you. Um, it's just sometimes like this, this year so far, I, I come to realize that we still have a lot of work to do. What, given what happened last year with the protests and with what we thought progress that happened in Hollywood, cut to you know January, I'm going into Sundance with a film and then I realized, my God, we have so much work to do when it comes to equity 
again, mm-hmm. it's 2021, where a lot of the information that were thrown out there, were they all performative? So I was very, and I became kind of depressed for like a whole two weeks. And talking about it today is really wonderful because to hear that, you know, we all want the same thing. We want, we're fighting for equity on every level and mm-hmm. also not allowing the artists that we work with, whether they're in front of the talent, uh, camera or behind the camera to feel that they're worth less. So if we're in the space, we actually expect less and I'm, I'm done with that, you know, so. Mm-hmm. Well, off of that, being done with it means yeah. that you've now entered the space, Nina, where you're saying, I'm not going to wait for someone else to create that equitable space for me or that fair space for me. Yeah or give me the financing that I, you know, or or sit here and piddle and argue with you over it. I'm going to actually create a new system for myself or for others that allows me to do this work, right? The way that I want to do it, the way I know it should be done, the fairer way to do it. So I think one of the things I love about being at Array is that every day in every pillar, what, what Ava's been able to build there goes way beyond filmmaking. Right? We're talking about every pillar of a company saying, we see the problem and now what are we going to do, right? Things aren't working in this area of the industry, then let's create a system to fix that. Um, there's something that we don't believe should still be in place 20, 25 years after some of us enter the business. Let's figure out a system that can address that. And so um, one of the systems we put in place recently that people like Nina and Bree and Shirley, you guys can start to use um, that launched today was a Ray crew. And, it, <laughs> and, and, and that, that is not a shameless plug. That's a plug to every producer listening to this saying, you have a tool. You don't have to feel powerless. You are powerful. You have a resource now that says, uh, there is no, there's no reason to say that there are any more excuses if people can't be found to work below the line in this industry that are women, that are people of color, that are underrepresented, that are all abilities. And, you know, the power that comes with being a part of something that you're creating that moves the needle, you know, rare in your lifetime, do you have the opportunity to actually change the industry that you love, right? Most people go their entire lives working in something in a field and they're not able to move that system in a direction that they believe it should be moving, whatever your belief system is. Here we finally created something, this database that allows people to put themselves inside of it. It's free for them, you know, no barriers for the crew members. And then folks like you guys who are producing every single day and in the trenches can go there and find them. And I just think there's just something, I just just can't tell you how freeing it was today to release it because uh, just being in a space where every single day we talk about this type of work as it relates to entertainment, I just want everybody to feel a little bit of that. So I think when you when you start to use it, you'll you'll feel that power and the love that went behind it. I mean, these are um, we have the power to do this. We're not we're not powerless. It, it gets depressing, Nina. It it gets frustrating. You're trying to figure out how you've been doing this so long, and you thought things had changed and they hadn't. But um, we we've got to take our power back. Absolutely. Oh, man, I love that. Go ahead, Nina. No, I was saying that because what we've been doing when it comes to crewing up, so you have now this database, we all just have to pick up the phone and call everyone because whoever line producer we're working with will say, no one's available. That's of the course. Thing. And I'm like, hold on, let me start calling them. It's very time consuming, but it's just what we have to do to just to try to make a difference. And we have made a difference when it comes to our television and our feature film realm. But it is, if there's a collective area we can go to and say, hey, look, this is, who's in New York? Who's in Atlanta? Who's in LA? Who's in the Bay Area? I mean, across this country or around the world, it's like, it's such a gift. It's such a gift because it's going to save us so much time and we can always tell the line producers that were hired by studios and networks and say, hey, look, don't tell me there aren't BIPOC crew available. There is some line producer out there on Nina's heart tonight. You can feel it, right? (laughs) Somebody, somebody, I don't know who that person is, but I do not want to, you know, you know, be (laughs) in their their path when Nina comes. But seriously, she's right. She's right. Even the work that uh, like Shirley is works with me and Hugh when we found each other through Hugh and we started like this little tiny database that came from Google and then uh, you know with Google wait, Sheets wait, and wait. they had a I'm partnership with Staff Re-Up. I'm going to stop you small but mighty. 
It was an inspiration for what we're doing. My small okay. Mic. <laughs> Um, and then to like do the partnership with staff me up to try to create these solves because like as producers, we're problem solvers, right? Like we just want to kind of fix the thing. And I get so sick of people telling me that they cannot find people. And so it's like, oh, you can't find people. Oh, there are 14,000 people in my community that started out from 27 people that I knew from this industry over the course of four mm -hmm. years that want to be in this industry, who are working in this industry, who deserve access to this space. Like you don't have an excuse. Absolutely. Um, Tammy, to kind of circle back to what you were saying about, you know, are using our power, um, thinking about it more so like on a production level, how do we ensure everyone is being paid equally? Like, how can we use our power to ensure that? I'm going to let one of the two women who are employing people every day take that question. <laughs> It, for me, it's about transparency, right? And stop, we, you know, in the same way that so many women, when you find out how much we make on the dollar compared to our male counterparts, as soon as you add any other, you check any other box for any type of underrepresentation, you start to see the egregiousness that happens and that secrecy that feels like, oh, it's my personal business to say what my rate is. When you drop that and you understand how much your white counterparts are making, then you can stand in your truth because I find that certain. Certainly for me, I've been an advocate for as long as, as soon as I found out what the rates were, to let people know what their worth are. And also to tell people to stop apologizing for the work that they do and tell them what they can go in the room and command and absolutely get, but they shouldn't shrink themselves. What I was finding, specifically with Black women, is that they didn't even know how much their like white counterparts were making. They had no clue. And then they were apologetic about asking for something that was like 20% less than what um, their white counterparts were making, which shocked me. It was always like, no, 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 you need to go in and ask for this. And you can absolutely get it because you deserve it because you're doing the work. You know, like you are not you.org. <laughs> like if they want a nonprofit, then they should go for a nonprofit. Like you are your business. Like you need to ask for what you're worth. I agree with you because many times we're so afraid to lose an opportunity because when the opportunity is coming at us, we're like, oh, we have a chance to do this project or that project. I'm not going to mess it up if I ask for more because we're so afraid to lose those opportunities. They're so far and few that come through. But then, then you realize, wait, when you're fighting for that type of equity, it, it's on another level because you're right. The, your counterparts are asking for double or triple what you <laughs> work for, right? And you're just like, wait a minute. So, so it's absolutely right. It's about not being afraid, thinking that you're going to offend somebody or mm -hmm. you're going to lose that opportunity because our counterparts don't think like that. They don't. And I'll, 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 yeah, and I will also say that you have to understand that your silence when you're talking about your rate and your worth is the system at work at its best. Mm -hmm. Every single time. Yep. I agree with that. One of the things I'd like to add is that when people are trying to negotiate for themselves, sometimes once again, back to equity, how do you know how to negotiate for yourself if no one has ever taught you to do that? How does a crew member know how to step? I mean, here's a line producer, you know, they wanna be a part of this business, they, they wanna be a part of this project that they're interviewing for. How do they even know how to negotiate for themselves um, if no one has ever sat down and said to them, you know, this is what we're doing over here, <laughs> you know, we're, we're doing it like this. So. I think one of the beautiful things about um, communing people together like Brie has done and like we're doing with crew is to say, hey, 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 let's come together. We're gonna show you how to market yourself. We're gonna show you how to sell yourself. We're gonna show you how to uh, spruce up that resume. We're gonna introduce you to other people. We're gonna host panels like this for crew members so that they can understand their power and, and their worth. And I think you know, there's a lot of talk all the time about you know, the worth of uh, directors and actors and producers and writers. But nobody ever tells the grip how to get in there and negotiate for herself, right? So where's, where's her advocate? Where's her ally? Um, how is she supposed to understand how to do that? And how does she know what the other male grips are being paid next to her that are doing the same work? 
that's going to take a conversation um, and being a, a lot more transparent in our industry than we've been in the past. We focus so much on above the line. A lot of our below the line brothers and sisters are sitting out there like, you know, well, you know, what about me? It's it, 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 classism exists even in our industry. I think we have to be careful with that too. We're talking about negotiating. If you're, you're going to host something about negotiating for producers, host it all the way down to the script supervisor, host it all the way down to the catering company. You know, mm -hmm. we love to strike a deal with the folks below the line. We love a good deal as producers, but I think it's important for us to also start to value those crew people um, uh, in a, so that they understand that they are valuable. Yeah, I think with the crew situation, it's also, it's, I think it's a conversation with the unions as well to be more inclusive because I think so many of production, when you go in, you see all the BIPOC folks doing the PA jobs, but nobody at the heads of department jobs. Mm -hmm. And that's when that's the challenge is about letting people in and let people grow in the infrastructure of a crew. So and then it depends on the budget of your project, whether it's television or film. And there's those kind of constraints um, for from my end of like just looking at producers overall being um, a female Asian producer. I'm valued less. I mean, not today, but for the longest time, I was just like, I just don't want to lose this opportunity. Mm -hmm. So you're willing to take work that are less than what you're worth in the in the industry and now i'm trying to teach other producers like don't do that don't let us be the first one to kick our fees in to make that work because you're going to have to follow this project for three years and and it's just like all it's the the mental exercise that we have to do is don't belittle our worth because we're doing everything we're hands-on we we are the creative allies of the filmmaker and the project and I think that's the toughest part this being a PGA panel I think too many producers were the first ones to lose on that battle when it comes to our worth and fees um, whether it's in television or film thank you thank you thank you thank you a, a, a lot of what I'm hearing um, uh, speak about is intentionality and uh, that's that's required in order to really have effective change like we have to be intentional in the work that we're doing so how important is it for uh for us to be intentional um and and inviting people to the dance and hiring diverse crews brie how about you start yes brie <laughs> I think Bruce might be frozen. Uh, Tammy or Nina, you have anything that you want to jump in with? Um, we are very proud at Array of the intentionality with which we even built the database with. And, and I promise you that wasn't a lot of stock line. Um, we say it all the time, right? Uh, here you have a new platform, right? that was built specifically for people who are below the line. We could have included all other areas, but we chose, we were intentional. Ava was intentional about saying, this is for crew folk who work below the line. Um, then the next step was we were intentional about saying who it was for and naming those folks and not being ashamed to name those folks. And then finally, we were um, intentional about the way we partnered with people to say, uh, hey studios, you know, this is not just our problem. I mean, how can you tell the person that's being underrepresented that it's their problem if they're underrepresented? It's all of our problems. So how can we collectively come together to do something about this issue in our industry? And um, I think by being laser focused on why we were building this, on what we were building and who was going to be in it and who was going to benefit from it and who was going to uh, make sure it kept going beyond us, uh, it, it, it's something that will, will hopefully one day not be necessary, but I think it will outlive us and grow beyond us and be, and it's not, you know, it's not owned by one entity like a studio or a production company, or it's not just for a certain group of people or a certain job class of people. It's for everyone who works in those crafts. And um, I've, I've enjoyed watching and being around other team members, um, even when we hired our technology team. Like, yeah, I think about those things. So you're, so you're making a movie and you're like, okay, the crew is inclusive and that's great. So let's get our swag bags and our gifts for our wrap party. Are you being intentional there? Like, are you making sure you're reaching out to people of color, to women-owned businesses, to support them, to make sure you're buying an immense amount of stuff 
right? You're, and you're spending, you're, where's your wrap party being held? Like all of those things you have to start to think about. So with the rate crew, one of the things we were intentional about is how we built our tech team, right? We made sure that this is an all women led team and it is women of color. And, you know, rare do you get to see um, uh, uh, women leading technology entities. And it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful thing. So, you know, uh, from DTUC, our African-American CTO, from uh, Natalia, who is our designer, who's based out of Columbia, our team looks like the world and therefore the product looks like the world. And therefore, when you come to it, you know, it, it's intentional. All of that is intentional. Every single step of the way, no matter what we did, we made sure that we pulled every, we didn't just talk about being inclusive. We were inclusive in our hiring practices and uh, the wages that we paid and just making sure that people felt comfortable even working in the space with us. Uh, I, it, that intentionality has to exist. So I do challenge, I, I do not produce anymore, but I do challenge everyone out there who is still in that game, everyone who's listening to this panel, to think beyond your sex when it, when it comes to equity and inclusion and to think beyond, be intentional about every step that you're taking to sell that project, to finance it, to mount it, to post it, every step of the way to distribute it. There's a, there's a way to be intentional and inclusive throughout the entire process. Agreed. Agreed. I think that am I still frozen? My no, but you were beautifully um, frozen. Oh, that's always good, right? Um, I think that for me, um, one of the things that I believe is that for every single studio and network that's ever reached out to you, one of the things I say to them is that you're about us as your constitution. And if you don't want, if you want to be recognized as someone who truly wants to do this work, then you need to realize that. I understand my value and my worth when I walk into your institution and I don't see myself. Hmm. And so if you want for me to take you seriously and you wanna do the work, then I'm gonna ask you to institutionalize the mission of DEI and to say it out loud in your mission. It's not enough to call us and have us try to find you these crew members. I wanna see that your infrastructure will evolve into a space that is inclusive so that um, you're not just making a solve for people who have like fed into this systemic racism, but like the people who are actually looking for the below the line crew looks like me, right? Because I think that often what happens is that um, because of the way our, um, the system of media is set up that your skill set is often dictated by your access. And if you had limited access, then you can't get certain jobs. And my ability should not be limited to a system that also excludes me, right? Like what I find is often is that, you know, black indigenous people of color want to be able to rise to the occasion, but we cannot be set up to fail. And the way that we are set up to fail is when the intention of a company or producers is to find us, but not to give us space and agency and the authority to find who we are. And I think that often the responsible thing when you are in a position of power to me is to be a student to your power, to sit down and to allow people to define and tell you who they are and to believe them. Because if you are not doing that, then you're being performative. And that thing that you're running from, that cancel culture, it's coming for you, right? And if you wanna be accountable to diversity, equity, and inclusion, then you need to truly learn not just how to be diverse in your thinking when it comes to your hiring practices, but what does your dentist look like? <laughs> you know what I mean? What spaces outside of work are you invited to and considered welcome in? Because if you don't, if you can't answer that, you can't come to work and then hear we are the world and feel good and understand why diversity matters. It just doesn't make any sense. So you have to truly audit really and do forensics on who you are and why it is that you even need to try to find black indigenous people of color. And we can give you the tool, but we can't help you understand how you got there. You got to do that work. Yeah, I mean, you <laughs> just gonna applaud Brie right there. Yes, <laughs> you do have to do that work. It's it it, it um, you also have to. I think we also have to give people a little space and grace about. I grew up in the South, the Deep South, 
And I think it's, it's also imperative that we give people space and grace and acknowledge their upbringing and what they were exposed to. It's gonna take some time for people to evolve. Um, and uh, uh, there are plenty of us out here ready to help people evolve <laughs> along the way. But I think also um, it's important that we acknowledge where everyone, how everyone is enter entering this conversation. I think Nina, that's what hit you about 2020. Here you are thinking, well, I, I saw what I saw. I experienced what I experienced. You did too, I think, right? So why are we having this conversation? Why does it still feel so different? And why does it still feel so 1985, right? So um, I thought we had made a change. I thought we had moved forward in, in our discussions about some of these topics. And again, we a lot of folks evolved fiercely through 2020 to a new place of understanding what DEI equity includes. All, a lot of people didn't then, a lot of folks start off 2020 not even knowing what any, that any of those words existed mm -hmm. or that there was a problem. So at some point, I think, you know, a little grace, a little space for people to catch up, but it still doesn't um, change the fact that I think we all have a role to play when it comes to helping one another uh, grow when it comes to not only work, but like you said, Brie, out in, in the world. I spent the last 10 years in Atlanta. So the black dentist comment resonated with me because again, when I lived out here in Los Angeles, that wasn't even, you know, you'd have to put into your network, where am I gonna find, does anybody know where we can find, you know? And then you get the one person everybody's using and, and you, it kind of <laughs> circulates, right? Yeah. Um, living, it, again, where you live matters living in somewhere like Atlanta, it was like, where can't you find a black dentist, right? So I think that exposure too, being exposed to different places, being exposed to different cities, different neighborhoods and different communities, different schools, where, where you send your kids, the school now. Mm -hmm. So it, it, yeah. I think that is going to help us move the needle. Once people start to integrate it into their regular life, like you said, and not just their work life, we're going to start to see things change. And Nina won't be so surprised next time. <laughs> yeah, where like where is the synergy in uh, between grace and accountability? And that's where I want to live. But me too. <laughs> I'll meet you there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> On some of the crews I worked with, because it's always tough crewing up, um, even in New York, it was shocking. And of course, there's the few that we have their names, but when they're not available, I asked, do you have a few people you can recommend that came under you? Give me their name so I can put them into the system so they can grow within it. So like, like we were talking about earlier, it takes more effort, but it's worth it. And also once they start working with you, I have certain you know, heads of departments, you were first ADs that are black indigenous P POCs. And I'm like, I would have conversations with them. I go, you're at a really great position. Would you consider when you go on your next job, next film, next TV, bring somebody under you to come up to, you know, for your department, mm -hmm. and just coming friends with these specific heads of departments and they actually hear you. They're just like, that's really great that you're talking about it. And I have this amazing costume designer I worked with um, on passing. Her name is Marcy Rogers. And I had these deep conversations with her and she's, and she'll, you know, reach out to me and say, I still remember our conversation. I'm going to bring up more people under me. She's incredible. But that's the, that's the intentionality that I feel like all of us who are producers, that we can make a difference and become friends and allies with all these people growing in the business and the crew and say, hey, I see you. Let's try to do this. Let's make a change here. There shouldn't be one of anything in any department at this point in the that, game, right? This yeah. is a, how long, how many decades uh, has, has this industry existed? There shouldn't still be one woman one indigenous person, one black person, one black, you know, in some of these departments. This is, it's, it's just, it's absolutely um, mind blowing to think that that's still happening. So you also have to ask yourself, who is your one? Who yeah. are you nurturing? Who are you taking under your wing so that we can start to build an army of black line producers and UPMs mm -hmm. of all the, all the places where people come to, to you and say, I'm looking for, and it's like this needle in a haystack type, type yeah. of, person in the position and you're sitting there you, you think for a second wait a minute I've been in this business how many years and we're still talking about how we're counting the number of people that exist in that in that category on one hand yep. um but again we we are powerful so yep. well how are we going to train up a new army of people to take our place who is your one 
who are you pouring into that will take your place when you exit this industry and who are they pouring into and who are they pouring into you've got i mean this is you talk about generational change in in communities and in people's uh lives there can be generational change in this industry too we are sitting in the midst of it yeah. you just have to embrace it and take it on as yours and own it right so Again, where in your lifetime do you sit in a place where you have the opportunity to change an entire industry? Yeah, I'm a more huge, powerful than we know. I'm a huge fan of a sponsorship over mentorship. Mm -hmm. And I also, I often joke that like, I like made it through the oppression Olympics, got out to the other side, called myself a unicorn and realized I don't want to be a unicorn. I don't want to be a unicorn. Like it's like, it's, nice but it doesn't really i want to see more of me in my world i should not be one of 20 or 30 or whatever it is like it just doesn't make any sense to me and so we shouldn't have to like climb through the oppression olympics and be like you're not going to believe what they're doing back there. <laughs> like, <laughs> what I mean. like, it's crazy <laughs> yeah we, i want to be able to have people like i think that it's wonderful to be the first i would really like to be like the 30th or the 100th or the you know the 500th you know, I remember when I came out of um, Spark, out of the producing program many, many moons ago, uh, somebody came up to me and they were like, you are the X number black person to ever come. And they thought it was something like really exciting, like, like, like there haven't been many of you. And I thought to myself, well, that's a doggone shame because y'all been alone a long time. So <laughs> why are, like, why is that a trophy? Right. So Bree, yes, yes, Bree. So, so, you know, I know the two of you, uh, three of you are training up a whole group of people because I see them coming into the, into the system, working on your projects. And um, it's really amazing to see when, when I'm looking at those crew members and their, their productions and what they're working on, how many times people are given their step up and their opportunity by other people who believe in equity and inclusion. I'll just say it like that, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. there are so many talented, beyond talented, extremely well-educated uh, folks who are working in this industry who are still struggling to get that fourth, fifth, sixth job because they just don't know that person. They're not in that system. Back again to the equity conversation. They aren't a part of that circle or that education that, that even knows that, oh, well, oh, we're playing, we're playing golf. What do we do? Like, that's where you guys all meet up on Friday night. I didn't know that that's a circle to be in. Oh, that's how you do it. You know, we're just been left out of the loop. Okay. Leave us out from now on. We got all kinds of resources now where we can find each other um, and, and, and take our power back. Yeah. And I think, oh, go ahead, Nina. Most of us who, who are in this space don't come from the connections. So we, we have to work 10 times harder just to get those connections and build within it and and like it's tough when we do see certain people who are our peers that come in because they are super connected where they come from money and then the rest of us are just like climbing to get to where we are and it's like and, and that's the connection that we don't have but what I think what we can also do is educate younger generation of people who want to pursue careers in film and television that it's actually a sustainable career yes Yes. And we we'll work with the academy. They have a great program with the high schools in LAUSD. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, many of us will volunteer to talk to the students. And then when we do have a production, when I was working in Oakland twice, we would invite young people to say, look, this is what a sound mixer is. This is what a cinematographer is. Like, so they can actually see that these are sustainable careers. And, and that's really great to instill in the younger generation to know they can pursue it. So they can have a head start on it instead of me after so many years trying to figure it out, you know, so. Yeah. yeah, so what I'm hearing you all say, because we we want our producers to walk away with some, with tangible takeaways that they can go and they now have tools and they can implement them, right? Nina, I'm hearing you say you, you intentionally inspire mentorship, you know, just by, by planting a seed in so many people's minds where they reach back and they bring people forward, right? Like I'm also hearing you say about, you know, you going out and speaking and talking to people and showing them the many different roles that exist within our world, right? Like Tammy, you guys have built this incredible database where now we can go and we can tap into it and we, all of our excuses are now removed we, because we have 
<laughs> we have a huge database, uh, Bree Chu with Who You Know, and two and amazing databases filled with incredible talent, right? So we have so many options of ways in which we can expand our, our talent, our talent pool and create a new generation, a generation of change and, and shift our entire industry. Bree, you mentioned something that's actually a, a talking point I want us to discuss, which is sponsorship versus mentorship. Um, can you talk a little bit about that distinction and what that what the, what the two look like? Yeah, I mean, for, for me, like mentors are people that you can like go to and they can be a sounding board and they can give you advice. Sponsors are people who are more senior than you. They give you access to spaces that you normally could not get to. And I think that that is the thing that truly moves the needle. And as people try to work from like the bottom up that we gotta be working from the middle up because there's so many people who live like me who are stuck in the middle. Mm -hmm. And they just need someone to pull them up and groom them to the C-suite. And so sponsors are people who take their responsibility as allies or as a person of color, but normally people who are allies are like, I don't know what to do. Sponsor right. a person of color. Sponsor a woman of color. Those are the things that you can do that create meaningful change when you give people access because there is a lexicon that exists in the C-suite and in these upper rooms and these conversations. And until someone understands how that works, how that system works, all the language that comes when you're in these executive rooms, they're never gonna be able to, like you need to give, be able to give them space so that they can get in there and they can grow and then they can pull up. And then you're gonna see that's when you're focusing on equity, inclusion, and belonging. Your diversity comes. It comes naturally because you're working towards the other three pillars. And then you don't even need to worry about diversity, <laughs> like in a lot of ways. Um, and so to me, sponsors, they put themselves out there. They position you in spaces. They help you with transparency and the lexicon so that you can be um, someone who grows in the field and really can make meaningful change and grow inside the space and add something add yourself, bring your entire self to work and like add to that space. Yeah, I, I think that um, as producers, some, one thing that we can do is just, of course, being very conscious of it. But like, I, I remember when I was producing a, a film called Roxanne, Roxanne, and the assistant costume designer, Deirdre Govan, was working so hard and diligently. And I said, how long have you been an assistant in costume design? She hmm. said, 20 years. And I said, wait, wait, 20 years you've been doing this and you're still assisting and she's like I just don't have the opportunities and it broke my heart and she's such a skilled costume designer black woman and I was just like this is a shame so cut to when I went to sorry to bother you in Oakland and I said boots you got to check out this costume designer so but everybody else around me was like you're crazy you're going to bring in somebody from New York and put them in Oakland and it's going to cost your production more. If you're going to do housing, you're going to do this and that. I'm like, let's do it. We're going to, we're going to eat that cost and figure it out in that budget. So Deirdre comes out. This is her first official costume designer job. Is mm. sorry to bother you. After 20 years working in the business. So, but that, that job now has launched her into this huge, you know, stratosphere of costume design opportunities. And so now she's giving back, she's taking people under her. But that's, a, it's like that one move for somebody who's been in the business for 20 years, it's insane. You know, it, it really- so you're, 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 you're striking a little bit of a nerve because we've been talking about this a lot <laughs> recently as, we, as we've been working on this project. And um, I work with two phenomenal ladies, Tulane Jones, who's president of our organization, and Regina Miller, our executive director, because all of this is done under Ava's nonprofit, Array Alliance. And we, we were brainstorming one day, like, okay, about this very topic, about all the people that we knew who had been working in secondary and third positions for a decade or more. And we were like, but they're fierce. Who's going to give them their, you know? So one of the ideas that we started to banter around was about expanding on the education side. The education work I usually do has to do with already made projects. But what does it look like if we start to purposely not talk about education programs where people enter this field, but what, I, what we like to call leveling up, right? You're a costumer, let me show you how to be a designer. You're a makeup artist, let me teach you about prosthetics and special effects, sis right? You are a uh, hairstylist. Do you know what the wig maker gets? 
<laughs> right? So why is it that, you know, there's inequity still within departments when you look at them as you rise, go up and down in them. And those prestigious positions that are at the very top that pay the most, that allow you to work a little more autonomously sometimes, aren't usually filled with people who are, I mean, it's already, you're already doing a lot just to make sure there are women and people of color in those lanes, but they're not, the top positions aren't often filled with women and people of color. And so from camera operator to DP, we talk about that a lot, but do we really talk about craft service to, you know, a catering company that does multiple shows around town with trucks and a facility to fix the, you know, like how do you level people up? So I think Nina, what you did was amazing. And it's, it's, it's a microcosm of how we can all operate in this, in this industry and in the system, taking people like Tulane and Regina and I were talking about who are mid-level or who just are ready to, to move over that hump, but taking them now in mass. Mm -hmm. How can we do it on a larger scale? Um, so that we can all be Amina and give, you know, 20 costumers a break on the next big thing. And thank you for investing in her. Thank you for going ahead and flying her out and putting her up. Come on, give me a break. People do that for people all the time oh, above the line. <laughs> so let's not act like it was a stretch to bring out somebody to give them a start on their career and catapult them into to the next phase of their life. This is, um, Tulane also so talks about a lot of times how you're changing communities when you, when you offer people the opportunity to use their skills in a way that benefits all of us. You're not just changing that person's life, but you're creating generational change in that family. When you go to a small town and tell kids that they can be this thing. You said something earlier, and I just wanna make sure before we end that the producers in the room know about the high school students that, um, that work uh, in the program at, at the academy. If you're shooting a, in any city or town, Always know, and this is the education Tammy coming out, there is a workforce development or CTAE program in every school district pretty much in America. We used to call it, remember like uh, Votech back in the day? <laughs> Brie, you know what Votech is, right? Way in the back of the school and in the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the trailers, right? Um, Votech is now a whole career path. And Votech, guess what it includes in almost every school system? Filmmaking. They have kids taking editing classes, uh, learning how to use cameras, sound and boom, visual effects, right? They're making these little mini movies. And then when they get to the 12th grade, everybody says, all right, now it's time to go to college and do something that pays. So if you are producing in a small town or if you're in a city, I do encourage you to reach out to your local school district and find out how you can bring kids in who have the skill set already. They're doing it every day in class. They're getting graded on it, but they've never seen it really in real life. That's how you level up. Amen. I'm over here church humming. Um, yes. <laughs> I'm rocking. So if we can put a home and I rock together. <laughs> you know what I'm thinking is like, I'm like, oh, Tammy, we, we should talk, right? I've had this idea for the last couple of years that I've been trying to talk to like studios and uh, production companies, anyone who will listen about the idea of nesting. Right. And so you take someone because, you know, I think that oftentimes like you, you finally make it into production. Right. You're finally do, telling stories and then you tell one type of story like you do a food show and all you can touch is tomatoes for the rest of your life. Right. <laughs> and what if we stopped assessing people by their credits and really thought about the skill set that is required to produce quality television and then allowing them to enter the space, but then allowing for consultants to help support them and nest them so they are set up for success and then you can build these stop gaps where the network or studio is still getting what they want but you're mm -hmm. allowing for someone who is like stuck inside a genre and if you check a box and you check a box and you check a box so you're just taking the work that is available to you because you need to be able to pay your bills right mm -hmm. but if you stop treating people by their credits and the work that they do and give them an opportunity to show up to things that they actually want to make like i want to stick around you know want it to like you know just make films for oprah or work for ava I worked on towing shows. Am I any less valuable because no. that's the only work that I had, you know, that I could do? And so I think that if we like 
walk away from the idea that people are just their resume and really look at their skills and allow for people to invest in them through nesting and all these other things I have for like what it should look like if you want a black production company to do physical production. I got a whole idea on what it would look like to do that. So people can stop having excuses around what it takes to hire black indigenous people of color and also to add to please say it out loud, right? I can't, I'm so sick of people coming to me like whispering like, oh, I need a black showrunner. Like, I just need you to say it. Like if you're looking for an Asian showrunner to tell the story, then say it out loud. There is no shame in it, right? Like you have to be decisive about your inclusion and stop doing this thing where you don't see color. Because when you're doing that, you're like essentially trying to be nice and polite and nice and polite is not the way to change this industry and the system. We have to be willing to say it out loud. Agree. Agree. Yeah, we also need some better laws too, because Brie, you know, I got I got a, a hand slap for saying, you know, for being specific the other day. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we, I mean, I can I could talk to y'all for uh, uh, for hours and hours and hours. We only have Nina for the next eight minutes, and I don't want to hog all of Nina for the next eight minutes. I want to open up. Uh, some questions to those who um, who are here and listening. So I'm going to start uh, fielding in some questions from uh, the, the folks attending. This uh, first question is from Kirby Washington. There are systems that have kept syst systematic racism and misogyny in place and well fed for all of the decades I've been a part of the industry. The unions are not on top of this at all those who benefit from these systems cannot undo them. Can you discuss how you might help the union members who are fighting these systems? Nina, Nina you have any ideas? Well, the thing is, it's cur with current union members, you know, it's like what we were talking about when, when we're working with these heads of departments, it's about empowering them to bring more people under themselves to to come up the system, but also making them conscious of it. You know, why there's a bigger fight and a bigger intention and motive that we want to shift the paradigm of this business. And it does take time from producers, whether it's me and other producers to have these conversations. And they, they're, because they're already in the system of the unions. That's the toughest part because unions are so old, they've been around forever. They, and, and there are generations of line producers and UPMs that come from that world. So they'll just keep hiring people they know and who are their or their family. So it, it's hard for them to reach outside of that. So for the current members of the union, we got to, we got to inspire them to, to, un so they understand what we're all trying to f fight for. Because a lot of times they don't know, like um, certain shows I'm on, they don't know that they're there because Forrest and I ruffled a lot of feathers to de get them there. But when they got there, they're like, we're here. And then they're like, we you don't know that we actually had to remove people to get you there. But I don't want to, you know, it's like, but having those conversation eventually they go, wow, we didn't realize it was a fight, you know? So, so for me, it's just really be, befriending and, and having these really important conversations and hopefully it inspires these current union members to, to do what we all wanna do. Yes, 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 we must connect and have conversations. I think a lot of examples that Nina shared tonight um, shows the power of connectivity and inspiration and just, just planting a seed. And like she said often, it's um, it's hard work, um, but it, in order to have change, we have to be willing to do hard work. But so also, go I ahead. Wanted just to say, whenever like we, as producers, when we see areas where we can pursue to make change, I try to do that because I see if a certain actor I'm working with who has a, an influential voice in this business, I would say, would you consider producing more? Because I need your voice to help me get some stuff done. You know, even though my current partner is Forrest Whitaker, and we, we do what we do, but sometimes I see a younger generation of actor that's like, has huge influence over the YA space. Can I have you join us on certain projects? Because I need your voice in the producing element to make certain changes because it, they echo louder than me yelling about it, <laughs> you know? So that's something is if I see those opportunities, I try to work with certain actors and there's couple of them I'm working with saying I need you in the producing space to help me make a difference. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you for that. Uh, Bronwyn Cornelius, um, more union talk, more union questions. What are unions doing to ensure more diverse rosters? This has proven challenging when trying to bring in new capable talent, as has fi finding diverse crew willing to work on low budget films, even if MFN crew rates, any ideas? I know this is a tough one because the unions, you, you do need them to come to the table and understand the importance of, um, you know, diversity in pulling people in and how difficult it is for some people to come in union and be able to meet the fees that are associated with joining the unions. And I think that, um, you know, you don't want this work to be like consequential or to like to shame people into doing the right thing. It's so, it, I think it's a very tricky thing and I'm hoping that the, un the unions show up more and I'm constantly um, thinking about the way to have them come to the table and allow and create access so we can break some of these systems because I think it's the hardest thing. One of the, the, the last frontiers that'll be the hardest to penetrate is how to truly, truly, truly create um, inclusive efforts when it comes to the union. So that's a that's a tough one um, for me to answer. Yeah, I agree. Um, there was a question sent. I don't know who it's from. They uh, you asked, can you talk a bit about training? If you could resend that question to Linda with a little bit more context, and if we have some more time, I will absolutely um, ask. Kilgore Donovan asked, should a person research the base pay and negotiate from there? Base pay, base pay for group for a crew because because the union set those standards and it goes by budgets. So are you if we're talking about base pay for you know writers, directors, producers, that's that's also a different conversation. So Yeah, that's yeah, it's that's a difficult one. The the rates are often like in the budgets and they're locked and there's not that much wiggle room. So that's a little um tough and it depends on the tier it's in. That's a, a little bit more complicated. Exactly. Okay. Would you consider hiring a white UPM woman versus a UPM of color? I'm not sure where to go in this male dominated industry. Absolutely. I, I want to hire who is best for the job. Like, you know what I mean? Like we, we want to hire who's best for the job. I don't have, um, for me, like, I would just want to see more diversity and inclusion in those roles, but it's not, I'm not picking people because of their race. I'm trying to make a concerted effort to create equity in the industry. So for me, um, the, the, the world is male dominated, right? But we don't want to use, um, any oppressed group as a, as a step ladder to hold up ourselves. We don't need to look down, we need to look up. Yep. Thank you for that. Um, Seth Bergen, Nina mentioned the struggle for equal funding and equal acquisition rates. Is the struggle for financing a quality problem, maybe because of funding, an audience problem, distributors can't justify higher acquisition rates based on popularity or plain resistance to BIPOC films? I think it's all in the gumbo. <laughs> I don't think it's a problem with, with quality because there's plenty of quality storytelling. <clears throat> I think it's a problem with the system that's been in place for decades of valuing projects starring BIPOC stars, talent, narratives, because they always say it doesn't travel overseas, which is a lie. Um, and also they'll use certain data and, and the data is biased. So, so people have subscribed to that forever. And then they'll say, well, you know, that film did well overseas because it's an anomaly. So there's always an excuse for something. But then, so, so it's not a, a, fundraising is one thing, but if investors who are, who dabble in Hollywood are listening to sales agents telling them that like, oh, don't buy Fruitvale Station because no one's going to watch that overseas. That's that's perpetuating that false narrative that's coming through. But those of us who are in this in this game, we're constantly making and producing and championing films that do well overseas just to break that system. And and but if I'm told just a few weeks ago going, well, you know, your film starring two women of color, it's going to be a challenge overseas. I'm just I've lost it. I've lost it. <laughs> and I'm like, I have Tessa Thompson. She's an Avenger. 
Okay. And you're telling me that there's no value or, or you're, you're questioning the value. So in turn, you're going to offer me less because you don't think it will perform. So that's mm -hmm. a very archaic thinking that's been going on for decades. So many of us have to consistently put out film, television, that travel just to break that system. And so, so that's where the uh, inequity comes from when it comes to mm -hmm. and, and um, distribution budget, budgeting, p and all comes hand in hand with that. I'm sorry, I'm sounding a little emotional. <laughs> No, no, no. I think it's true. Yeah, I think it's totally true. Because I think that like, we, you know, we bring ourselves to work, right? Like, no matter what, yeah. who you are. And I think that like, the value system that we feel in our lives when we're picking our dentist, or we're at the supermarket is the same value we bring to work. And so, um, you know, people want to be seen and they want to be heard, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you have a value system that tells you that someone from a marginalized community is worth less then everything that comes out of your mouth come, <laughs> comes from that gaze. And it's kind of hard to, um, to break into that system that tells you you are less. I think that the moment that I'm always like trying to get people to do the homework about the way that we've been educated not to see one another before they even try to have a conversation about diversity, equity, and inclusion, because it's not until you realize that we have been educated to believe the definition of value, right? Like we all have our own Google when it comes to the value of black skin and when it comes to the value of women. And if we're mm -hmm. having our language through that gaze, then you're diminishing the value of people based on what you've been taught. But I'm here to tell you that you've been taught nonsense. And like, <laughs> let's, um, that's what I mean when I say like, you have power, be a student to your power. Let me define who I am as a black woman. Mm -hmm. And I just need you to believe me. Like, you know what I mean? I don't need you to tell me what I'm worth. I tell you what I'm worth, you know? And great storytelling travels, period. Yes. Period. And, and that's something that it's, so we, yeah, it's something that's still a challenge today, but, but we're, you know, all of us here are trying to make a difference and that there's collectively, I think there's a lot of power in what we're all trying to do. And it's, I'm super inspired by Bree and Tammy. I'm, I'm just so inspired by you both. I can't wait to dig into the database and, and also contribute to it when I discover more people um, to add to it. And I'm like, so excited to connect with both of you. Um, I'm just inspired by this whole conversation. Yeah. Nina, I, I know we were four minutes past when we, we agreed yeah. to let you go. So thank you so thank much. You. I got to jump. I have to go raise money, see, for my films. <laughs> yes. yes, yes, yes. That's important. Go get some money, Nina. Go get some money. All right. Talk to you guys soon. Thank you. Take care of the bag, Nina. Okay. Bye. Bye bye. Um, so another question, when building a team, what are good qualities to consider? People who can do the job and who are humane and kind and um, are passionate about the work. And that is the important thing. I also think that um, sometimes the question comes up about, you know, can I tell a story about, um, you know, women of color, if not, I'm not a person of color. I'm, and my question is, can you tell a story about World War II without an expert on war <laughs> or the military? Like you have to be able to allow people to come into the room with agency to define who they are. And so the importance of hiring crew, it's not like, I want people to kind of walk away from the idea of diversity and really like lean into inclusion, equity and belonging being like such a, a critical pillar to the work that you do so that when you're telling stories, as people who love stories and who are storytellers, who are committed to the truth of storytelling and you are telling a lie if you do not have diversity, equity, and inclusion in your crew and in your storytelling. Even if you tell the story of Susan B. Anthony and the things that she did with the suffrage movement, if you don't have a black woman in it to tell you, but like who could say, what about us? <laughs> then you're still <laughs> telling a lie. <laughs> <laughs> Marching in the back. Yeah. Right? Of this movement, Delta Sigma Theta, right there in the back of the line. They made a march in the back, but they marched nevertheless. Mm -hmm. um, I would say when you're looking for a, um, when you're looking for talent, what I've learned from um, the Array Crew database is to get beyond the resume. We, you know, we give people a lot of space on their pages to tell us about themselves. So it's not, loading up the PDF of your resume happens like in the top right hand corner, way over here, right? 
but telling us about yourself happens in the center of the page. And from, um, you know, during this pandemic, folks have had a lot of time to do Zooms. And there are a lot of folks out there who work on crews who have been able to finally express themselves in forums and talk about their skills and their abilities in a way that goes beyond what you might see on paper about them. So I would say uh, going beyond the resume means learning about whether or not the skills that they have are transferable too. Mm -hmm. you know, just because you're doing a certain thing um, in, out in the world now does not mean all, every skill set out in the world has a place on a film set. A film set is just a microcosm of a small city. You got yeah. your mayor, you got your school teachers, you got your people who take care of the lights and the trash and the, you know, think about it. Think about it. A film set's a small city. Every job that you find out there, you find in here. So when you're looking at people and you go beyond their resume, you'll start to open yourself up to people who you otherwise wouldn't have thought about for some of those positions. Mm -hmm. They might not have the education that you're used to seeing or the pedigree, or they might be overeducated, right? And have, um, have more experience than necessary for some of the jobs they're applying for. But if you, if you stop looking at just the, the credits and start mm -hmm. looking at the person and talking to them about what they've done before they sat down in front of you, I think um, you'll have a, a just by default, you'll have a more diverse crew because, you know, it'll be diverse in other ways as well. Um, there was a woman that uh, joined the database, um, that submitted to join the database recently, and she lives in Atlanta and she's a line producer for uh, public broadcasting at PBA. And she said, I don't know if I really qualify because, I mean, I work in public media. I was like, wait, did you say you've been line producing for 20 years? tell me what kind of shows you've been doing. And she named off her shows, right? If you just saw her resume come across your desk in Hollywood, you're like, oh, this woman works at a little public broadcasting station. That woman has done more production, right? At a high level with budgets and schedules than a lot of the people that people are willing to take a chance on out here on bigger, much bigger productions. Get to know the person beyond the resume. Her skills are definitely transferable out to a bigger space and all she needs she doesn't even believe in her her worth quite yet like i, I can be out there yeah you can um if somebody just gets a chance to, to talk to you and get to know you and doesn't just look at what you did on paper um, mm -hmm. um that's just a conversation it doesn't cost anything yeah you're more than your last job and i think that um it's less about the crew and more about you as a leader and you being deliberate in your choices and you making sure that you are setting people up for success and getting honestly the same nurturing that you would want as someone who's growing the space from wherever you are. And so um, do you just wanna you know, hire a bunch of people and then sit back and go, now do it? Or do you wanna come from like, you know, a loving space with passion for what it is that you wanna do and make sure that people are treated well and you allow them to you know, you set them up for success so that they can rise to the occasion. Um, and so for me, you know, when you're picking your crew, don't do, you know, I think that all of us kind of tend to operate from like a, out of a white male straight normative. And if you're gonna dismantle the system, you cannot do that operating with the same language that has gotten, that has gotten us here. We have to be willing to challenge the way that we think about everything. We have to deconstruct everything and you can still have great work and still have great art and still get your projects made but you cannot do it doing it the way that we've been doing it it does not work and if you're thinking that it works it can work better we promise you by, <laughs> yes. um, this this one will get brief by expanding your territory right just a little bit you'll actually start to meet people and see people and Again, it's just a conversation. No one's saying, hey, go out and hire the female whatever, right? It's a conversation. Get to know people. Yeah. Um, we have five more minutes uh, before we wrap out. And I, well, now four. So maybe one to two more questions. This is another one that just came in. What's been your most effective strategy towards towards getting over the, we don't have the budget dismissal for increasing rates or hiring of BIPOC employees? I don't know if I necessarily um, have that challenge. I, um, I tend to move on from people that don't get it. 
That's why you get it or you don't. And if you get it, let's have a conversation. If you don't, I'll be waiting um, <laughs> for when you do. Love it. Bree, can you um, explain a little bit more in detail the idea of nesting? Okay, sure. Okay, here are my thoughts. One is that I think that um, certainly the work over the last four years is like what Hugh has done. I've evolved from just trying to find people jobs. I have learned that, you know, trying to find people work is a conversation about grapes and I really care about the vine. That's what I learned. <laughs> so if I wanna break the system, then I need to talk to the system about some of the things that they do. And I've um, had conversations with networks in studios about um, incentivizing them for having diverse hires um, by upping a, a little bit of their production fee if people can meet certain thresholds. Additionally, when we talk about some of the conversations I've had have talked about um, not hiring people based on their resume, but really their skill set. So you take someone who ha who is a proven um, proven in a field of their field, but they really want to do like docu series or documents. Maybe they've only come from like being a a shiny floor showrunner in unscripted. Mm -hmm. um, that you would allow for that person to meet them as a human, right? see the potential in them and understand their skill sets and how they translate and then take showrunners who have normally dominated that space and give them a consultant fee so when you give them that consultant fee they're there to help make sure that that uh, showrunner is set up for success and then you nest them by making sure their second their third and all those other folks understand that genre but that they're not producing in a vacuum and that they understand they can go to and then you get the network or the studio involved in the thing that's being created so that everyone is invested in the same thing or to take like a Netflix model that has an overall deal with some of these showrunners and then you allow them to have showrunners who on the network studio side that they're lending out to the production, that showrunner or whatever line it is that you're trying to accomplish um, with uh, like nesting someone is already in the production company's budget. And then the production company basically gets whatever the, the budget is, less that producer fee. So that it really doesn't cost the studio anything to have that showrunner like, you know, the, the, the budget they would already have for these series is already covered in the series budget that they would pay anyway. So it's not really costing the network of the studio anything. And then um, for physical production companies in making sure that someone has the capabilities that what you would do is you would take a, a production um, a, a production company that runs a black production that has physical production and maybe they don't have the full capabilities that you will allow them to partner with a, um, a production studio that maybe has always had the work and then you let them do physical production for the series nest it by a production company that normally gets that work they can split the um proco fee and maybe do some back end and margin and then by season two or three when they've proven it you've allowed them to build up their infrastructure that so they can produce the program on their own and then they get ownership of it and maybe that production company falls away but they always get like maybe a little producer fee or a little bit of back end so they're not totally you know losing money. So those are many of my thoughts about how we can really truly change the system and attack it in a way that I think is um, substantial and critical. Like jobs are amazing, but it's the system and the problem and the people who are in positions of power that I want to truly infiltrate. I have a very small goal of wanting to break the system. No big deal. <laughs> She's intentional. <laughs> no big deal. One, one last thing before we go, uh, Tammy has array crew opened up to producers to use as a database. Uh, we, our studio partners launched it with us today, and so our next phase involves uh, independent producers, independent productions, um, smaller productions. Right now, though, anyone who's affiliated with any of the major studios or streamers has access to a very crew. Awesome. Fantastic. We are uh, at time. Uh, Y'all were just phenomenal. So great. I am so appreciative and grateful for everything that you shared. You all are filled with wisdom, ideas, power, courage. Just, I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Thank you so Shirley. much. Yes. Shirley, I do have one thing. Um, yes. Part of what came out in our press release today was something that really struck a nerve in me um, or, or when we were doing background research for, for the release today um, uh, was the fact that uh, some data that came from Annenberg a couple of years ago from Dr. Stacy Smith, 
And I just wanted to say this out loud so people understand kind of the gravity of where we are, right? Because when you say it, like name it, like Bree said, this, this is what it is. Um, when she looked at uh, the top 265 films, 265 films from 2016 and eight to 18, we always talk about directors and writers and producers. When she looked below the line, less than 1% of A, B, and C camera operators were female. There was one female best boy electric, four female key grips, eight female best boy grips. 14% of costume designers were from diverse or racial ethnic groups. 9% of women filled the first AD post. 5.9% of production designers were people of color and there were zero female gaffers. Right? That's, that's where we are. So we can do better and we can be better and we have the tools and the resources. Bree's database and her resources are phenomenal. And we've launched something today that can be a resource to folks too. We can change this narrative in our lifetime. That is true. Tammy, thank you so much. Um, I'm so thank happy you. to connect with you as well. Congratulations on the launch of the database. It's fantastic. Thank you. We got to connect in front of all these people. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it took. <laughs> All right. Well, Tammy, you have left us with marching orders. Fix it. That's right. Fix <laughs> it. Let's all evolve, please. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Thank all you for right. having us. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Everybody have a great night. Thank Bye. you. Bye. 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 Was I supposed to stay? <laughs> Was I supposed to stay? Okay, okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Have a great one. See you. Bye.